Hello everyone, this is Dee, and welcome to my tech talk. I'm going to talk about immutable data structure today. Immutable data structure, basically, they are data structure that cannot be mutated. That's it, that's the talk. Uh, but we're going, to, we're going to actually walk through why we should care about immutable data structures, uh, what they are in terms of how they are implemented, and also how we can use them in JavaScript. So what is the challenge that immutable data structure try to solve that we might be interested in? Right. So let's take a look at this example and see if we can identify what's the problem. So I have a project array that contains three elements, right? Stack sum, good shopper, and capstone. And I put in two functions and pass my project array into two those, those, two, those two functions. And what I'm wondering is that after those two function call, what will my project array be, right? What can we say about what we'll see from this console log? We can say nothing, right? This project array can now become an empty array, or maybe an array with a million elements. We don't know. And that's the one of the biggest challenges in programming, which is mutable state. Right? Our program has a state that we try to keep track of. And uh, because you keep changing all the time, it can get very confusing. So let's look into this problem a little further. What is a state anyway? Right? So a state, stealing definition from Rich Hickey, is value of an identity at a time. Also, a disclaimer, this talk is pretty much stealing Rich Hickey's idea uh, for all his work that has done, that all the work he, di he did in the past 30 years. And we care about state, especially in the context of React, right? Because React is all about we render the UI based on the state. And the changes in UI should be driven by the changes in the state. So we'll have something just like this. Our initial identity, which is state, has an initial value of full, and the UI will render based on full. And once we set the state to bar, the UI will render based on bar. So we have this one single identity called state that can have different values at different points of time. Right? And this is where Redux comes in. Redux is like, you have a global state that can be changed by anything. This is not good, right? So I'm going to encapsulate our state in the create store method so you can now change it directly. All you can do is to create those redu reducers that will explicitly change your state in very specific ways. And that's one way to deal with multiple states, is use functional programming and eliminate all the side effects. And there's another way to look at this problem, which is basically just to get rid of this mutability thing altogether, right? So in our previous example, we have one identity or one reference to our state as a state, variable state, right? And you can have different values at different times. So you have something that looks like this. But what if for each value, we create a new reference for a new value, right? So we still have one single identity, which is the state that we are interested in. But every time the value changes, we assign a new reference to the new value. This way, we can track the different values using different references. So we have something that looks like this. So our initial state will be state 0 that has a value of full. And the UI will render based on full. And once we set the state to bar, we'll get, it will give us back a new state called state 1. And it will render based on state 1. So we still have our single identity of state but at different point in time, it could either refer to state 0 or state 1. And that's, we talk about how mutable state is one of the bigger problems in programming, and how this problem can be solved uh, by controlling how the state changes, uh, el eliminate side effects, and also by separating value from time, which is uh, eliminating mutability. But you might start to think, OK, if every time we are changing the state, we have to copy the original state altogether, doesn't that mean that we have to copy the whole thing? And wouldn't it be really slow? And wouldn't it take a lot of space? Right? So that's not good, because as programmers, we care about performance. right? How can we have immutable data structures that have native or near native performance? And this, there's a solution, which is try, or tray. This is a tray, uh, try kind of tray. Uh, so our normal kind of tray, this is our normal kind of tray. Right? We have the values on the node. right? But for tries, we have the values on the leaves and the indexes on the node, right? So at the bottom, we have our this is a really liked uh, structure with five elements, right? And how does this work? Uh, basically, if we are looking for uh, the element on index five, we can turn the number five into its binary transition of one zero one. And what we will do then is just traverse down the tree, dj by dj, right? One zero one, and we get to the sixth element, and we see okay, there's nothing there, and that's pretty good. Because we just performed a lookup operation that is logarithmic instead of linear. Right? So that's some performance in terms of lookup. So that's lookup. What about copying and making changes? Right? 
So for example, if we want to replace Rick with Taylor, what are we going to do? We're going to create a new node that will point to Taylor, the new value, and then we'll keep traversing after tree and point to the new nodes we uh, created. And once we get to the root on the top, we'll have our new try that contains the new value. And this is actually also pretty good, because if you look closely, you'll see all the pink nodes didn't change, right? They're shared between the old version of the try and the new version of the try. So that's some performance in terms of space. We don't have to recreate the whole structure every single time. So the, the data structure I just showed you is called a bitmap vector try, which is the array-like immutable data structure. And, but what about objects, right? Objects don't use numbers as indexes. They use keys, and keys can be like anything. Um, and so we'll have something like this, right? So instead of using numbers, each object will now use, each person here, will now use their initials as their keys. So we have E for Eric, D for David, and so on. And what we do, do then, right? The solution is also pretty simple. We just hash the keys, right? So for example, if we have a hashing algorithm that can hash the letter D into the number one, and then we can use the binary transition of one, which is 0, 0, 1, to traverse down the tree, and we'll get to David, right? And this data structure is called a hash array mapped try. Uh, which use, and it uses the same pass copying and structural sharing technique that the array like immutable data structure used to gain performance. Uh, and this way, we can actually have immutable arrays and mutable objects that has a very small performance overhead in terms of time and space. So we actually have something to use uh, in production, right? And how do we use them? Do we have to create all the structures from scratch ourselves? No, we don't have to. Oh, here. <laughs> and how do we use them in JavaScript? There are already people out there who wrote libraries to implement those data structures. Uh, first, we got Immutable.js, which is a library put out by Facebook. Apparently, it's very popular on GitHub. And also, we got this library called Mori. Mori uses the interface uh, from ClojureScript. Clojure is this functional programming language created by Rich Hickey, the guy I talked about earlier. And, uh, this, and he's the guy that implemented those data structures like 10 years ago. So let's look at an example from Immutable, right? So we'll have a list of three elements, one, two, three. And if we want to add a new element to the list, we'll push four into the list. And it will give us back a new list, list two. right? And we can then check the original list still has three elements. And the new list will have the fourth element on index three with a value of four. And this is the same code in Mori, uh, except that now instead of a list, we'll, create a, we'll be creating a vector, which is the closure equivalent of array. And then we will do more conjunct, original vector, and the value of 4 to get a new vector v2. And we can still see that the original vector still has three elements in it, and the new vector v2 now has the fourth element on index 3 with a value of 4. Let me give you a final push um, to use this immutable data structure in, actual, in your actual development. So let's think about reconciliation in the context of React, right? Every time the state updates, React will try to figure out what changed in to determine what needs to be uh, re-rendered in the UI side. So if we have this collection that we had earlier, um, you will see that uh, the blue ones is the old version, the yellow ones is the new version, and the pink ones are the ones that stay the same, right? When React compares the old version and the new version, whenever it gets to a pink node, you will know this is the same thing as last time. I don't even have to go deeper into the structure. This is the same, this has the same reference, it's the same value, I'll skip to the next thing. And once I find a yellow, yellow node, I'll know this is the thing I should update. So you got a faster reconciliation out of the box by using immutable data structures. You don't have to do anything. And I hope you give it a try. So I hope you try out those immutable data structures in your project in the future and not mutate your state.